without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the Father's Day, dads. Uh, we hope it's a special day for you. But today, is, it's not just your day today. Today is the day that we honor our graduates. And so um, specifically our high school graduates, we've already honored our college. I'm just kidding. Uh, we are so grateful for our college graduates as well. Before you came in, there was a little uh, bulletin out there that had a list of all of our graduates, both high school and college. And so before you leave, if you didn't grab one, make sure you get one. So you can pray over those kids but also if you want to send a note of encouragement, you'll know who they are, you'll know what their future plans are. And so, um, but I just want to take a few moments um, and just to take, this is a big deal. This is a big occasion in our students' lives. And so we, we do celebrate together as a church because we are family. And so um, I want to take a few minutes to charge our graduates. They're here in the congregation, some of them are. And so I'm going to let them stay with their families uh, for the time being before we call them up. But um, I also just want to say I'm so thankful for our student ministry and for our, um, our young adult ministry. Our student leaders are just the best, and a lot of them have been uh, serving for, gosh, a long time, since Jesus, right, Jamie? Yeah. And Bob? <laughs> um, they knew Jesus, and so they were able to 
tell the kids exactly, just kidding, we tease them about that all the time, uh, but we're just so grateful for our student ministry team and just the ways that they consistently pour out, uh, pour themselves out for our students and they prepare lessons and they're there for all the special things and they're rooting them on and I, I'm just so incredibly grateful and I am so grateful for our young adult and college ministry because you guys, it is not normal for a church these days to have a a booming young adult ministry, and our church has one. And they're meeting on Sundays. They're also meeting on Thursdays, and there's about 20 kids in there each time. I mean, that's that's amazing. And so I'm so, so grateful. And just because I was looking out, and I, I think this is going to be really cool, if you are a student ministry alumni, so you grew up in the student ministry, I don't care if, well, maybe since I've been here, if, um, if you would stand, if you've graduated from our, or if you're a current student in our youth group, would you stand? If you grew up in our student ministry or you are a current student, look, Michael, that's a lot. You too, you too as well. I see you guys in the back not standing, but anyway, um, the, thank you. Go ahead and take a seat. Look, they're here. They're here, and we are so grateful. And so I want to take a moment because um, this is the one Sunday I get to do this. I want to charge our graduates before we call them up here. I want to give them a charge uh, this morning. Um, and I know that graduates receive a lot of advice this time of year from lots of different people. They have mom and dad telling them what they need to do next. They've got friends telling them how they should be spending their time. They have guidance counselors and academic advisors helping them get things in order so that they don't mess it up at the last second. They have their youth ministers challenging them in graduation services and they have community leaders that are inspiring them at graduation ceremonies. But ultimately, after all the advice has been given, graduates, it's your life to live, and you get to choose how you will live it. We can try to tell you about it. We can try to tell you to live your life well. We can try to give you all the warnings we can. We can try to challenge you to make a difference, but no one can live your life for you. You have to make your own choices, and you have to live with the results. And for your parents... This is a time that's filled with a lot of excitement, anxiety, and probably a little or a lot of fear. They're wondering, what's going to come of all the prayers that we prayed for you when you were young? Will you embarrass us or will you make us proud? Will you be safe when you're out running around on your own? Or will you still call to check in or will you only call when you need more money? And not that I would know that from experience. Um, this is an emotional time for the parents. But also for you graduates, this is a unique time that is filled with a lot of excitement, a lot of anxiety, and perhaps a little fear. Or in the words of Taylor Swift, maybe you feel happy, free, confused, and lonely all at the same time. Yes? Stepping out into the great unknown always brings out these kinds of emotions because it forces us to consider questions that will define your future. Questions like, who has God called me to be at this time in my life? What has God called me to do at this time in my life? And do I have what it takes? Those are questions about identity, purpose, and provision, and you won't always have the freedom or the time on your hands to pray and think and dream and talk about your answers to those questions. The grown-up world is going to demand a lot of you. Decisions, appointments, bills, work. Before, you're no before you know it, you're caught up in the daily grind that keeps you from answering those questions. All your time and energy are going to be swallowed up, and there's not a lot of freedom left to think about great possibilities. The real world is not going to afford you to dream about the future and what God might be calling you to do. But you have time right now to think about those questions while you're standing at the boundary line between the old world that you've known and the new world ahead. And in the Old Testament, Israel found itself precisely in that place at the boundary line between the past and the future, but they didn't get there quickly. While under Pharaoh in Egypt, Israel endured harsh taskmasters to obey and large quota demands to be met. They had no freedom, no power, no place, and no authority. Much like school, but way worse. When God finally rescued them from their situation, they didn't know who they were on, uh, or what they were supposed to do with their freedom. People had been telling them what to do for 400 years, and now they had to be responsible for themselves. But God was gracious to them. He told them about who they were and what they were to do, and God promised them that they could make it and that they had what it took. 
But as we all know, the Israelites got tripped up time and time again, and they began answering those questions about identity and purpose and provision in all the wrong ways. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They lost sight of who God called them to be and what God had called them to do. And it's very similar to what happens to those students who show up on their college campuses or in their new workplaces, and they don't know how to respond to their newfound freedom with no one watching over them and telling them what to do. So many students, just like you, end up wandering in the wilderness. So these questions about identity and purpose and provision shouldn't be put off by students or adults sitting here today because they're important questions for all of us. Israel found itself at the edge of the promised land, at the boundary line between their past and their future. And there was no question about where they were going, but there were many questions about who they would be and what they would do and if they had what it takes to accomplish the task when they got there. So they paused on the banks of the Jordan River to listen to Moses deliver a 30-chapter commencement speech about the answers to those questions, otherwise known as the book of Deuteronomy. And at the end of the speech, Moses passes the leadership baton to his assistant Joshua, and then Moses passes away. And as you can imagine, Joshua is very overwhelmed by the big expectations that now rest upon him. And he's about to step out into the great unknown, so he's probably feeling some excitement, anxiety, and a little or a lot of fear. And then God spoke to him right there at the boundary line between the past and the future. And he says this, Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, I know a lot of things have changed since the days of Joshua, but there are a few things that haven't changed, and this is what I really want to charge our graduates with today, and all of you sitting here today. First, you must remember who God called you to be. Joshua is the one God God called to lead, and people will always second-guess a leader. Why are we crossing here and not there? Why are we waiting so long? Why do they get to go across first? Why are we going so slow? Everyone has an opinion about everything. So the words that precede Joshua's call to lead are be strong and courageous. Joshua had to stand with strength and courage in order to remember who God called him to be. If he forgot who God called him to be, he probably would have given up or given in or settled for something less. And the same is true for you. God has called each of you to be the best version of yourself that you can be. And remembering this requires strength and courage because there are people, sometimes friends, sometimes advertisers, sometimes even family members who will offer ideas and plans for you that may encourage you to settle for second best. You will have people pulling you in all sorts of directions and offering you all kinds of opportunities. But like Joshua, you must remember who God has called you to be. The second thing that hasn't changed is that you must remember what God has called you to do. In verse 7, God tells Joshua to be careful to obey all the law that Moses gave. Don't turn away from it and don't compromise on it. At the heart of remembering what God has called you to do is the book, God's word, the Bible. Whatever you do, do not neglect God's word. The Bible is full of examples of people asking God who he is and what he wants, and God answers faithfully every time. It gives us every bit of wisdom that we need when we're struggling to live in obedience and live in a right relationship with God. It's the book that God uses, according to 2 Timothy 3.17, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God tells Joshua to keep the book of the law always on your lips, so talk about it. Meditate on it day and night, so read it and think about it, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. If you're going to remember what God has called you to do when you go from the past to the next, then you need to read the book and think about it and find some friends that you can talk with about it. Then you will do what it says. Actually doing what the Bible says requires strength and courage because other people will be quick to point out that the Bible is outdated and has no relevance to our lives today. And here's what breaks my heart. Many Christian graduates who are being recognized in their churches across the country this year will go on to adopt that stance for themselves in the next four years. My prayer is that it won't happen to our graduates. Holiness 
love, grace, and truth are not outdated and are not irrelevant. The Bible isn't the problem. If you're going to remember what God has called you to do, then you're going to have to get into the Bible and allow the Bible to get into you. The last thing that hasn't changed is that you must remember that you have what it takes. Joshua had what he needed to be who God had called him to be and to do what God had called him to do because he wasn't setting out on the journey alone. He had the people of God on his side, but more importantly, he had God. Verse 9 says, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. And I want each of our graduates to know today that you never need to feel like you're all alone on the journey because the people of this church are on your side. But most importantly, I want you to know that you never need to doubt that you have what it takes because God is on your side. His Holy Spirit is with you wherever you go, so in him you have everything that you need. When you cross the boundary line from the future uh, into the future that God has for you, there's going to be times when you're going to feel like giving up. There'll be times that you don't know what to do. There are going to be times when you're lost trying to find who you are. But don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. Remember who God has called you to be. Remember what God has called you to do. And remember that you have what it takes because of the power of Christ in you. And may you be successful wherever you go and prosper in whatever you do. So congratulations, class of 2023. We love you and we are so very proud of you. Yay! (laughs) So now comes the time to recognize our graduates is the part they love. Um, So we're going to have first um, Ansley Burnett. Ansley just graduated from First Colonial High School and Legal Studies Academy and will be attending Virginia Tech. This is my handsome Vanna White right here. You stay here, babe. Um, Next is Ryan DeConti. Ryan graduated from First Colonial High School and plans to join the Coast Guard. Um, our next graduate's not here this morning, but Jen Rex Road graduated from Kemsville High School's Entrepreneurship and Business Academy and will be attending Tidewater Community College. And did Alyssa, is Alyssa here? Did Alyssa? I didn't see Alyssa this morning. Alyssa graduated from Salem High School and plans to attend an apprenticeship program. And we're going to shout out real quick our college graduates because we're so proud of them. Um, Natalie Cox graduated from Regent University with a Bachelor of Arts in Christian Ministry with a concentration in pastoral care. Yes, we're so excited for her. Um, Jacob Mayo, who's here this morning, graduated from the University of Virginia with a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science. And Tyler Parker, he was here at the 930 service this morning, but so we celebrated him. He graduated from Old Dominion University with a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science. So we're so proud of you, and we love you guys very much. And so we're going to pray over um, our graduates and just know that we are here for you. You You have a place to come home to. Wherever God leads you, we are your family, and so we love you. Um, Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the life and the gift of each of these graduates. We thank you for seeing them and their families through their schooling, and we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to teach them about you along the way. We thank you for the blessing of allowing us to be part of their lives. And Father, as they go their separate ways, we pray that you would continue to be their guide and to be their protector. We pray that you would help them to lead godly lives that will bring glory and honor to your name. And we pray that these students standing before us would be strong and courageous, believing and trusting that you have called them and that you are always with them. We ask that they would be bold to stand for what is right, even if that means standing alone. Father, may they live in the strength and the power of your Holy Spirit, being led by you every step of the way. Father, we pray that they would find Christian community wherever they go that will encourage them in their faith and hold them accountable to you and to your word. And God, we thank you for our young adult and college ministry we have here at our church. We thank you that they are doing that. Father, may each of these students enjoy their new freedoms and their new opportunities, knowing that you are the giver of all good things. 
May they walk in faith, seeking your wisdom and seeking your direction. And we can't wait to see what you do in and through each of their lives. And we pray for us as Kings Grant Baptist Church that we would be a continued encouragement for them and that we would continue to invest in them and to care for them. So now, Father, go with them on each of their journeys. Fill them with hope and with confidence for the future. God, we ask that you would order their steps and lead them to the future that you have planned for each of them. And may you lead each of them on an adventure with you that will shape the rest of their lives. And it's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Congratulations. Now, lest you fear as you look at your clock that I'm going to be here till four this afternoon. No, no, no. I'm going to be here for the next ten minutes just to affirm what Beth Anderson has done and tell you that that was an absolutely fabulous sermon that we just heard. Amen? And she picked one of my favorite people, Joshua, because he was a powerful man. He stood on God's truth, and he heard what God said when God said, Be strong and courageous. And I hope you realize that this was just a couple of days before they crossed the Jordan River to go into the Promised Land. Now, they had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And Joshua was one of those spies that had gone into the Promised Land 40 years prior to check out. And the other spies said, no, 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 we can't go in. But Joshua and Caleb said, yes, 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 we can go in. And so, Beth, thank you. And Beth and Ryan, thank you. Because these folks are not just working at a job. They are staff people here. They are volunteers here. I think Beth is staff and Ryan is a volunteer because Beth said so. But God bless both of you and all of you, young people and young adults. I am thrilled because I've been there many, many times with young people and young adults. I've been a youth minister, a college minister. I've been a campus minister on college campuses. Years ago, everybody that worked with Mickey and me were young adults and college students. When we had our beachfront ministry, over a 12-year period of time, we had 150 young adults that worked with us over that 12-year period of time. Absolutely thrilling time of life for these people, but a challenging time, as Beth said. And I'm not going to try to preach her sermon again. I'm just going to affirm the fact that we have heard. Now, I'm going to ask... All of you old folks, Bob, you included there, brother. Uh, did you hear what Beth said? Did you take it personally for yourself? She was not just talking to, to the young adults and the young people. But of course she was, but I'm hoping that each of you took that personally, that that was challenge, that was truth, that was God's sermon for you this day. So Beth, thank you, my dear. That is just amazing, and I'm thrilled to be able to affirm you young people and you young adults and Beth and Ryan, because they are a gift to all of us. Amen? Amen. Yes, please. I invite you to focus your attention on the cross that means so much to us. And I'm going to ask and help us to reflect and remember for just a few minutes. Because as it were, we have had the privilege over the last several weeks to sit at the very feet of Jesus Christ, the master teacher, the Lord, the Savior of our lives, and he has taught us through this greatest sermon ever preached. 
And he has taught us principles of his truth and his kingdom. And I feel led for myself and for all of us to just look to him and to remember and to soak in just a bit more of some of what he said and how it impacts our lives and how we need to consider it as we move forward because it is, as we've said several times, foundational for our Christian life, for our family lives, for our church life. And so allow me to just remind you and as I just refer to some of these wonderful principles that Jesus has taught us, please look to him, listen to him, honor him, and remember him and apply. Please apply, as I will, these principles to your life. Because remember that he started in this Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, and he said things like, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons and the daughters of Almighty God. And blessed are you when you're persecuted persecuted because of our love for Jesus Christ. And always, he said, be salt and light for this struggling world because this world and all of us in it are in desperate need of salt and light. And even in our struggles with things like anger, and lust and broken relationships be respectful and decent and turn to the Lord to understand how we're to handle those things and we are to turn the other cheek even when we're in conflict that we're not to seek revenge but that we're to love our enemies and he taught us and he continues to teach us how to pray. He said to go into your closet and pray directly with your Father in heaven, saying, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we emphasize that that is a statement to you and I individually that we are asking Almighty God to bring about his ways in each of our lives, in each of our behavior, in each of our minds and spirits because his ways are the right ways. And he said, do not worry <laughs> But understand that your father knows what you need, even before you might say anything about it. And instead of worrying, seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, and all of his ways, and everything will be taken care of. And don't fret and worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have enough issues of its own. And then he taught us about judging. And yes, he said the first and foremost thing is to be sure that we're looking at the board in our own eye and not just the speck in our brother or sister's eye, but that we're to come before him to be accountable and take responsibility for our own flaws and failures. And we have to be careful about giving truth and righteousness and sacred things to people who are not worthy of that. And 
Sometimes we have to shake the dust off of our feet, but do it under God's guidance. And he said, yes, as you seek the kingdom of God, you can ask and you will receive. You seek and you will find. And you knock and the door will be open. And he promised us those things that we just need to ask and seek and knock and that he will respond. And then as he moved toward the final stages of this powerful teaching and sermon, he gave us four warnings. Now, remember, we looked at that realizing that he gave us these warnings because he wanted us to be with him. He wanted us to have proper relationship with him. And he said that there are two gates and that the narrow gate, enter by the narrow gate. And we determined through other scripture that he is the gate, Jesus Christ, and that we're to enter through him and by him and under his guidance and under all that he would teach us. So enter by the narrow gate, he said. And then he said, beware of false prophets because there are people all around that would like to deceive and distract us from God's ways. And that we are to know them and recognize them and even to judge them by their fruits because false prophets cannot produce good fruits. And then he said something very, very drastic and to be considered deeply by each one of us because, and I'm going to read this specifically, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And so we came to that and we talked very specifically about that we must know him. Know him fully and completely. Know his character Know his love, know his grace, know his ways. Live by those ways. And then when we know him, then he has promised us that he will know us. Know us specifically, know us by name. And then we would not ever have to fear that he would look at us and say, I never knew you. So we are to know him. And then his final warning at the end of this beautiful, powerful sermon and teaching was that, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And we have known and we have seen in Scripture and we have declared and we know and we know and we know that Jesus Christ is the rock. And he is the rock upon which we must build our house. We know that he is still building his church and that he is the solid foundation and when we stand as individuals, as families, as a church family. When we stand on the rock, then even when the streams come down, the rains come down, and the streams rise, and there are floods and difficulties all around us, that the house will not fall. It will not crash and collapse. 
I just ask right now as we reflect back and then in just a moment consider moving forward, I just ask that you take a couple of minutes in silence and continue to think about what Jesus Christ has said to all of us through this powerful Sermon on the Mount. A statement, many statements for which we're all very thankful. Please just consider for a couple of minutes. Jesus, we come before you as your family, as your people. You have invited us. You have chosen us. You have welcome, welcomed us into your family. And we come before you reflecting on these powerful, powerful words of teaching, of principles, of behavior, of life. And we just have to say thank you. And our th gratitude is from the depths of our heart, fully in our spirit, completely in our mind, and we pray earnestly for the commitment of each of us that we will build our house on the rock, that you will be the foundation for who we are as men and women, who we are as family members, who we are as King's Grant Baptist Church, that you will be the foundation. And we know that you have commanded that. We know that you've made that possible. And so we thank you. And our prayer is for us to commit and to give ourselves and to obey and to live the kind of life that you want us to, to be the kind of people that you need us to be, to know you, to know you totally, and then to go and make you known to others, to be the witnesses that we are supposed to be. We pray for that. We pray for people to be saved. We pray for us to share the gospel truth, the good news. We pray earnestly for us to be that kind of people here in this church family. And we thank you. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the scriptures that we're able to study and to remember and to learn from and to reflect on over and over and over and over so that we will absorb it deeply in our spirit. Thank you, Lord. And we press on. We press on with your guidance, with your forgiveness, with your grace. And we press on. Because it is what is to be. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes when I think about things like that, I'm just not sure what to say next. Because those are powerful things. Those are amazing things. Those are godly things. They're not just my things or your things. They're Jesus Christ things. And that is where we focus. And that's what I felt led. And I do want to share with you that this all has led me and I trust will lead us into these future weeks because I was impressed after finishing the sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, after finishing what he had said to us that we've just reflected on, that now it was absolutely necessary for you and for me and for us to follow Jesus. <laughs> now that may seem like a, a simple statement. And I know you're here because you know Jesus. I know you're here because you want to follow Jesus. But I also know that we all struggle with that. 
And I believe that it is our responsibility, it is absolutely necessary for all of us to be reminded of that on a regular, daily, daily, daily basis. And so what, if you want to call it a sermon series or an emphasis or whatever you would like to call it, but what I feel led to press on a little bit here today and then in future Sundays is to look at the behavior, the teachings, and the actions, and the example, and the totality of Jesus Christ. Because we have declared, he has declared, Scripture has declared that he is the rock, and he is building his church on that rock. And so what I want to do here for the next 10 minutes or so is I want to remind you of what happened immediately after his Sermon on the Mount. Because we find that Jesus, after he had finished this powerful teaching in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, in the 8th chapter of Matthew, he immediately moved into practicing what he preached. Now that's a good phrase. Because what I am about to say to you and what Scripture says to us is that he just didn't sit up there on the side of the mountain in front of probably hundreds of people and give this wonderful sermon. But then as he stepped off of the side of that mountain and came down, then he put into practice some of what he had already just said. And in these next weeks, we're going to look carefully at the things that he said and the things that he did so that we can follow him, so that we can know him even better than you and I know him today, I trust. And so in chapter 8 of the book of Matthew, it says that as Jesus came down off the mountain, that the crowds were following him. Now there's the key word, following him. And that's part of why I feel impressed that you and I here in this place on Sunday mornings, we've got to follow him in, in total, in depth, in the reality of who he is. And the crowds were following him. And it says that a leper, a man with leprosy, came and knelt before Jesus Christ. And the man said, Master, if you're willing, I know that you can heal me. And what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, leave me alone. Go away. Go away. Don't bother me. No. You know that. He looked at that man. Remember, leprosy. This man was eaten up with a terrible disease. What, how did they treat lepers in that day and age? Unclean. Unclean. Avoidance. Put them away. Certainly do not touch them. What did Jesus say to that leper that was before him? He said, sir, I am willing. Jesus Christ is saying to this leper, I am willing to heal you. And then what did Jesus do? He touched him. He touched this diseased man. Remember, one of the terms that they said to lepers, untouchable. And Jesus touched him, and the man was healed immediately. Here's this outcast, and Jesus practices what he preaches. Next, we're told that a centurion approached Jesus. Now, who and what is a centurion? A Roman soldier. Now I'm going to remind you, as horrific as it is, what happened as Jesus went to the cross at the hands of centurions, of Roman soldiers. Beatings, spit upon. Now this centurion is standing in front of Jesus saying, Lord, I have a servant that is paralyzed and in horrible suffering. And Jesus said, well, I will go to your house 
and heal this man. And what did the centurion say? No, no, Jesus, my house does not deserve you in it. The centurion said, if you will just say the word, if you will just declare that this man can be healed, then he will be healed. The centurion is saying that. And what did Jesus, what was his response? Scripture says that Jesus was astonished at the truth and the statement and the faith of this Roman soldier. Astonished was Jesus. And he declared that never in all of his experience had he ever seen such faith that this Roman soldier had. Remember, the Roman soldier was an enemy. Remember what Jesus had preached? Love your enemies. Encounter them. Be with them. Turn the other cheek. Be a person of the love of God. And now Jesus is saying that this centurion has faith like he's never seen before. <laughs> and the centurion said, Lord, if you'll just say, then my servant will be healed. And thus it was. At that very moment, the servant was healed. Then Jesus goes into Peter's house. We find out here that Peter had a house. Peter also had a mother-in-law. That means Peter had a wife. <laughs> and the mother-in-law was sick. Now here's this woman who's frail and sick. What does Jesus do? He goes in and immediately goes over and touches this woman who had a fever of some sort. And she was healed. And then many people came to Jesus in that setting. Many people with demon possession, with bad spirits, with diseases. And we're told that he heals and he heals and he heals. And the crowds are following him. There it is again. They are seeking Jesus out. Because he's practicing what he preached. He's living the way that he taught. And then, in the midst of the crowds, there is a teacher of the law. Now, that means a Pharisee. Now, remember, please, the Pharisees were always trying to trick Jesus. And the Pharisee said, Jesus, just tell me and I will follow you. Now, was that a true statement? We do not know. It may have been a trick. But Jesus taught this Pharisee, maybe challenged this Pharisee, because he said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their own nest, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. A lesson? Yes. And then somebody said, well, Jesus, I'll go with you, but I need to, to bury my dead. Well, Jesus said there's a priority in life and let the dead bury their dead and come and follow me. What does he say to you and me? We have all sorts of priorities in our life. Some of them are very good. Yes. Jobs, education, family, children. Yes, yes, yes. But Jesus said, come and follow me. Remember, he's practicing what he preached. He's asking us to follow. That's what we're going to study over these next weeks, to follow him. Then we're told that Jesus gets in a boat. He was on the water often. And all of his disciples, all, there was a whole group of people that followed him. And there was a, I don't know how many people were on the boat. Maybe it was the 12, maybe it was more. But Jesus is on the boat. And a, a ferocious, that's the word in scripture, a ferocious storm comes up. It is violent. It is wind and waves. And it's tossing the boat all about. And what is Jesus doing? He's sleeping. Oh, my goodness. Is Jesus worried? 
He's practicing what he preached. He's not worried. He's sleeping. Are there other people in the boat worried? Oh, yes. It says that they were frantic, basically. They woke him up and said, Lord, 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 we're going to drown. They thought they were going in the water and they were ready, perceiving, anticipating drowning. And Jesus said, oh, you people of little faith. Now just let that sink in for a moment. I don't want Jesus to say that to me or to us. Oh, you people of little faith, why are you so frightened? Why are you so fearful? Why are you afraid? And Jesus turned and rebuked the wind and the waves. And his disciples said, what kind of man is this that the wind and the waves obey him? But they do. And then the last scene in this chapter 8, these various, I believe, illustrations of him practicing what he preaches. He goes into this, the region of the Gadarenes. And we're told that two, now another Gospels, sometimes it's one. There's no disagreement there. But two demon-possessed men come out to greet him or to stand in front of him. And I don't know that it was a greeting because these are demon-possessed. And Scripture says that these men were so violent that nobody could pass by at that place. So these men were wreaking havoc because of their demon possession or their upset or their violence and they come before Jesus and they the demons confront Jesus and says they say why are you here Jesus son of God are you here just to torture us and then they say if if you're here to do something to us send us out and send us into this herd of pigs you know the story there was a herd of pigs close by. And the demons were saying, well, if you're going to do something, just send us into that herd of pigs. And Jesus says one word, go. Now this tells us that Jesus Christ has authority over the demon realm. For that we are deeply thankful. Because Satan does all sorts of weird stuff to you and me. But Jesus Christ has already won the victory. Jesus said, go, and the demons came out of those men, went into the pigs, and the pigs couldn't take it. Ran down the hill, into the water, and died by drowning the pigs. Then the people that were all around ran into the town, and they told the town people about all this that had happened. Drastic story. They were talking about what this man Jesus Christ had done. And then some of the townspeople came out, and I find this very interesting, but it is, again, part of what Jesus teaches, part of what he says, part of what he lives, part of what he asks you and I to live. The townspeople said, please leave. Now, remember those demon-possessed men? They were no longer demon-possessed. <laughs> he had cleaned them up. They were no longer violent. They were no longer threatening people on the roadside there. But the people were frightened at the power of Jesus Christ. Please leave. Because this power that you've demonstrated makes me uncomfortable. I think that's what they were saying. Now, we don't throw rocks at people like that. Because sometimes you and I are uncomfortable at the power of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we want to say, oh, no, no, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to think about that. I certainly am not going to expose myself to that. Please, Jesus, leave. No. Please, Jesus, come. Please show us yourself so that we can know you and we can share you with other people. Please remember, we are to be witnesses of the power of Jesus Christ. 
And that's part of what I want. I want for you. I want for me. I want for us. Is that we will see. Maybe a new. Maybe deeper than we ever have before. The power of Jesus Christ. So that we will. Be sure that we can make him known. Since we know him. And therefore he knows us. Please think about this. Please pray for this journey for all of us as we follow Jesus Christ. Let's pray a moment. Um, so a couple years ago, we started um, doing these grad boxes. And every year, people go, what is in the box? And so I'm going to share with you what, what's in our grad boxes um, so that you guys can know what, when you give, you support ministries like our student ministry. And because you give, we're able to do things like this to bless graduates and their family. So I'm going to quickly. You're going to want one of these, I'm telling you. <laughs> look, look, look how heavy it is. Um, so the girls are getting this, um, it's a prayer journal, beautiful prayer journal. And Ryan gets one too, but his is more manly. Um, so prayer journal, each student gets a new Bible and it's not just a plain Bible, it's an apologetic study Bible. And I've heard from a lot of students when they go off to college that this, they love this because they're able to talk, they're able to understand more and they're also able to share their faith uh, with, their, um, with their friends at school. So here's our, here's our grad box. And inside, you have fun things, like just fun things. We have a confetti popper so they can go home and pop some confetti. That's just fun. But they have uh, gift cards. So we have gift cards to Amazon as they're getting ready to prepare their new dorm rooms. There's Chick-fil-A and there's lollies so they get to celebrate with their families. Um, there's an alumni t-shirt so they get their exclusive student ministry alumni t-shirt that they get to earn at the end. Um, there are some devotionals. There's a devotional called Before You Go. And there's also, this one's for the girls, Dear College Girl. Um, and it's just an incredible resource. But also what's in these um, boxes are letters from uh, student ministry leaders, from staff, from you in the church who have taken time to write words of encouragement to our students. And so I actually have more sitting on my desk that I need to put into these boxes because they keep coming in. Um, and so these words of encouragement uh, to each of these students, that's what's so meaningful. And so these kids will get to open these boxes, and hopefully it's a lot of fun. Uh, but thank you for giving and supporting the student ministry so we can do things like this to bless uh, these kids. And so.